Hey folks, welcome back to Green Joe Coffee Truck. This is Vince and today I am going to be covering my horse trailer conversion and my do-it-yourself coffee cart. So this project was a bit of an experiment. It's kind of got two projects together at the same time. The vision was to basically create a coffee cart that rolled into a horse trailer or a landscaping trailer or some type of trailer so that you, you can get it out of the elements and be able to transport it but also start working on building that trailer out to be a food trailer or a coffee trailer coffee truck the goal was to create a kind of financial and experience stepping stone where someone can start off with a pretty minimal investment, test their market, get some experience underneath their wings, and then slowly start reinvesting back into the business to grow it into a larger business. The very first stepping stone was a tabletop coffee setup. This is the type that you see at like farmer's markets or um, sometimes you'll see them at 5Ks. It's not a car, it's not on wheels, it's basically just a temporary setup where you can make coffee and, and serve it. So that's the bare bone basics. Then the next step from there is coffee cart, the do-it-yourself coffee cart, which, which we'll cover here. After the coffee cart's been established, buying a horse trailer or a landscaping trailer or something like this that you can roll the coffee cart into, not only for transportation, but also to, to serve out of and slowly start working on building that cart out, setting up the windows, putting up the walls, getting some plumbing and electric put into it. I liked something real small because you can tow it, it's lightweight, you can tow it with your, your car. And then eventually either branching off into another trailer or if you've built up the finances at that point, a brick and mortar, doing a coffee roaster, a truck, whatever your heart desires at that point, you'll have the finance and the know-how to be able to pivot uh, accordingly. This is a stepping stone for people that want to that want to get into the coffee industry. They don't know how. Something you could start off with very little finances and just put good old elbow grease into it and build your dream over time. In order to do this, I wanted to create a pathway where someone who had very little construction know-how would be able to start getting their cart built out. They would do this by hiring handyman or contractors, their own plumbers and electricians to, to build their cart for them, as opposed to you know trying to purchase a cart that may or may not meet their code and regulations for their, their county. This person probably has less than 5K. That was the budget that I set for the do-it-yourself coffee cart. I said, okay, a little bit of savings and a strong tax refund and you can get yourself started. This was set up to be a uh, initially a side hustle someone who is working a day job and maybe on the weekends they can put in a little bit of extra time so they can hit their farmers markets maybe do some weddings the goal with this is that they would be able to, to hit at least two events per month and if you can make 500 bucks per event then you're gonna be sitting pretty at a thousand bucks per month that you're bringing in of excess income now, some of that will go to just your lifestyle but hopefully you'll be packing away some of that for the coffee trailer and then after you rock that for a summer, at the end of the summer, you'll have enough money to start looking for a landscape trailer or a horse trailer or something where you can house the cart on a more semi-permanent basis. So the trailer build out in my head initially would just be pretty basic to shoot you straight. I mean, maybe a serving window, which would allow you to serve year round if your code and regulations allows it. So there's multiple reasons that I favor this method. One, it allows people to build experience, especially folks that don't have any entrepreneur experience. Experience. They get their feet wet and seeing kind of how this world works, right? How this side hustle business works. Two, it allows folks to test out their ideas with a minimal investment. So a lot of times folks are like, well, I'm from a small county, I'm from a small town, you know, am I able to make money? And a lot of times they'll want me to calculate and I go, hey, I, I can't give you those numbers. You know, ultimately in order to find out if this is something that you can make money off of, you're going to have to test it out. So it allows people to, to try it out without a significant amount of investment. And if it doesn't pan out, you can always just sell the coffee cart, and recoup your investment. It also minimizes the risk of the coffee trailer by removing the loans from the equation. So I always say that loans guarantee that you'll have a bill, but ideas do not guarantee that you get profit. So that's important to keep in mind, you know, especially in the beginning when you're first taking off this business and getting started, you know, if you have a 
small business loan or some type of a, a loan, even if it's just a home equity loan, you know, you're going to have a payment on that. And when you first start off with coffee trucking, you can't guarantee that you're going to be making money right out the gate. So uh, loans guarantee bills, ideas do not guarantee profit. Also, it lowers the risk because it helps keep the general cost of your trailer down. Um, you're buying things that you know you need as opposed to buying things that are hypothetical or you think you need. And I think that's really important, the buy-as-you-go mindset, because this allows you to invest into things, equipment, product that you know is going to turn a dollar, that you know is going to sell coffee, as opposed to in the beginning, if you were to uh, purchase with no experience in the field, Field, a lot of times you're going to be buying things that you may or may not need based upon you know your workflow your menu that type of thing so it's keeping your overall cost down which helps lower the risk as well and lastly it provides stepping stones and allows for pivots I'm a big fan that if you're getting into the mobile coffee industry or the coffee industry in general it's nice to be able to do catering and indoor catering and outdoor catering. They usually require two different sets of equipment. And this method allows you to slowly build up your equipment over time so that you have a more robust uh, set of equipment and you can handle different types of catering gigs, whether that's indoor or outdoor. Okay, so let's first start off with the, the first set of the project, the cart, okay? The cart was, the, the intention of the cart was to make a do-it-yourself cart where you can pick up all the basics that you need from your big box hardware store like Home Depot or Lowe's. And that was really the intention and the goal. I also wanted to build that one out to meet the majority of specs or the vast majority of code and regulations for coffee carts in the country. But as I got digging into that research and started reading more and more code and regulations, I felt that the coffee cart was a very unique set of code and regulations and that there was a lot of variety between counties and cities and states. As opposed to mobile food trucks, i.e. coffee trucks, the regulations for those can be fairly streamlined. In my code and regulation course, that's what I set out to do, was to make a minimal viable code and regulation that if people were to stick to this code and regulation, it's gonna meet the vast majority of code and regulations in the country. And there are some exceptions to the rules on that one you know california they want a four inch extension of your floor onto your wall you know not a lot of code and regulations require that chicago wants your generators to be in line they don't allow for portable generators not a lot of code and regulations require that but things like you know water tanks and plumbing and electric there is a, a lowest common denominator so to speak of code and regulations 20 gallon fresh maybe 30 gallon fresh 15% larger hot water heater needs to pump out at least 110 degrees but the espresso carts it was just so up in the air that ultimately I, I wasn't able to create a one-size-fits-all code and regulation course for the espresso cart so I did have to eat a little bit of humble pie on that one and just kind of let that part of my vision go all right so let's first talk about the frame now when I first started getting into the coffee cart, I wanted to create a frame that people would be able to bolt together because I thought welding would be a special skill that not a lot of people would have. You know, I look back on that and I go, you know, it's pretty easy to find a steel welder, someone who can weld, weld steel together. Aluminum welding, however, is a little bit more difficult. TIG welding. So, however, the benefit to aluminum is it's lightweight and it's pretty dang strong. So this is what this is one of the mistakes that I made. I went out and I bought $300 worth of aluminum L-beams and T-beams. And I measured out all the corners and the cuts and everything and said, okay, this is the exact measurements that I'm going to need these beams to, to start setting up the, the framing. And you can see these measurements on the coffee, on my website, on my coffee cart blogs. You'll see the rough draft and all that jazz as I was going through these measurements. I needed the cart to be less than 34, <clears throat> excuse me, less than 36 inches wide. It had to be able to meet the ADA requirements, um, the American Disability Act requirements for door width so that we can get into doors. So 36 was the, the, the maximum width that I, that I was allowing. But the aluminum frame turned out to be a mistake. And it was a really valuable mistake. Um, what this one taught me is buy when you're ready to build. Because I had purchased that stuff out 
probably a couple months before I was ready to start kind of getting serious with it. So I was in that creative mindset at the time where ideas are flowing a lot and I was just wanting to get started and pull the trigger on something. You'll see this fault come up multiple times throughout this project where I would purchase something before I was ready to, to build. In construction, they say cut to measurement, you know, measure it first and then cut it. Basically pull the trigger when you're, when you're ready to pull the trigger. So I bought all this stuff. It comes in, I cut it all. I get ready to, to build it all. And I'm looking at this and I go, this is just too complicated, right? In the spirit of Vince Lavopa, he overcomplicates things. So, you know, I looked at it, I said, you know, it's just, it's too complicated. So I scrapped the idea and instead what I bought was a stainless steel table with casters. And I said, okay, I'm just gonna put the walls on this stainless steel table and the casters hold plenty of weight so I don't have to worry about weight issues. Stainless steel meets the health department code and regulation. And because it's easy to put together and easy to order, people are gonna be able to order this thing from either online or ship it from their local Home Depot and Lowe's and get it right to their doorstep. So I thought, man, that's the way to go. So I scrapped the aluminum idea, bought the stainless steel table and started working on building that out. Now there were some things that I didn't foresee. One of the big things that later came to haunt me was that on the stainless steel tables, the lower shelf is smaller than the upper shelf. And so you lose about six inches all the way around on that lower shelf. There's multiple issues that that turned out to be. One, it's a loss of space, precious space that come to find out. And then two, it becomes very difficult to attach things to the bottom because normally you would want to tack onto that lower shelf. Now you don't have anything to tack onto. So my solution to that was putting some two by four studs, tacking them onto that lower shelf so that I have something to, to tack on my walls onto. Basically, I'm framing out my own studs. But this turned out to be a huge mistake. The main reason why is you, you just cannot have exposed wood and, ha and expect to have it pass the health department. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit this stuff now because I've built multiple trucks since, but I'm always a fan of, of learning off my mistakes. So as much as I don't want to admit them, I have to throw them out to you guys so that you can see how I screwed this up. And then, you know, hopefully you screwed up a little bit less on yours. So if I were to go back and do it again, I would skip using the two by four studs and instead you can use vinyl composite that you use for artificial wood decking. That will pass health code. It's easy to screw into, it's lightweight and it can attach to that steel pretty easily. But if you wanna skip all that headache, then just take the recommendation that I ended up recommending in the coffee cart ebook that I created after building this thing out. And that's to just start off with the workbench. The workbenches are nice because the Butcher block on top has a resin on it, so it's a washable resin. It's not exposed wood, it'll pass health code. And then it has nice straight legs, easy to attach. The other thing I really like about them is they're adjustable in height. So for someone who's a little bit shorter, they can adjust it as needed. You can definitely build it out from steel. And in the coffee cart ebook, I give you all the measurements. So if you wanted to just cut, you know, one inch tube and do some welding or hire someone that has welding, or maybe you have a friend that can do welding, you can totally do that. It's super easy. When I ran the numbers, it wasn't too far off from just purchasing a workbench. And the nice thing about the workbench is everything's already painted for you. So you don't have to go in and paint it. If you were to do one inch tube steel, you know, you gotta sand it down, weld it, and then repaint it afterwards. So it's just, it's a little bit more labor. It'll be cheaper. It's probably gonna save you about a hundred bucks, but in my head, it's like, eh, you know, the headache of doing all the, the welding. Maybe, maybe you're into welding though, so who knows? Anyways, moving forward. Okay, so the next thing that I attacked was the plumbing. Now, my original vision was to have a triple sink that sat inside a drawer so I can pull the drawer out for dishwashings because nothing said that the triple sink had to be accessible during the work hours as long as you had enough utensils to make it through your work day and you had the availability to wash your dishes afterwards by the code and regulation i was able to keep mine underneath but man that turned out to be the just the largest pain in the ass because one getting the the thing to slide out was difficult but two the plumbing was really where i struggled i had used accordion plumbing and this, this three quarter inch piping that I purchased off of Amazon and it just turned out to be a mess. It was very difficult to attach. The idea of it pulling out easily didn't turn didn't pan out. That idea didn't hold water. 
And it might have been that I just didn't have the construction know-how to build that thing efficiently, but ultimately I ended up scrapping that idea. Rather, what I did is I cut into the tabletop, the steel top, and I uh, set that on hinges so that it became a pop-up drawer. So I still had the serving area on the top where I can you know, make drinks and that type of thing. But then at the end of the shift, I would be, be able to open up the serving window. I just put it on those little gaskets that you push down and it pops up. So I had it on those and that seemed to work out okay. It wasn't, it was, it was a little awkward because you had to kind of, because you had to put your hands underneath the tabletop and wash your dishes from underneath. I don't, I didn't like it. It was a space saver, but it made just washing dishes a pain in the ass. And ultimately, a lot of coffee catering is washing dishes. And so uh, would I do it again? Probably not. I would probably just put my plumbing, my hand washing sink, my triple sink on a whole different cart and just wheel it in separately. Not only would that cut down the weight of my cart, but it would also allow me to put a um, propane tank on my triple sink as opposed to using an electric hot water device, which would reduce my electrical footprint on my generator. So, you know, you learn as you go. Anyhow, so I, I ended up settling for a triple sink uh, underneath the serving counter. The sinks that I had, there was four sinks in there. They were all nine by fives. I use an accordion quick connect faucet. That worked great. You can disconnect it easily and be able to attach a sprayer. So if you had to wash out Cambros or something like that, it was easy to do. For the hand washing sink, I just used a gooseneck. All my fresh water was with PEX piping. I used a half inch. And for my gray water, I used a three quarter inch accordion piping, but it was so difficult to put on. I think in the future, I would just move to a one inch PVC. It just seemed so much easier to work with. Okay, so for the hot water heater, I used, uh, that one was a 2.5 gallon Bosch. Um, those things are great. I'll put an affiliate link in the description. This one was like the fourth one I've used. And every time I've used these on all my trucks, they've just been absolutely wonderful. I've used tankless water heaters as well. The one I've got was from Ecotemp, and that one worked out well too. So not to discredit the propane uh, water heaters at all. The issue is the fire department. With a lot of code and regulations, they won't allow propane to go indoors. I didn't want to set up a tankless water heater on the espresso machine. It's on the espresso cart itself because ultimately I needed that cart to go indoors. And I've tried electric tankless water heaters and they were a nightmare. So for me, I'll only do tankless if it's propane. For the electric, I went to Bosch. And the reason why I like the Bosch is because it has a dial on it where you can set the energy usage. So it has like a maximum, a minimum, and a recommended, so to speak. So I don't have to necessarily uh, put it on the max and, and use the 1500 watts that it's it's going to demand. I can turn it down a little bit. For my water tanks, the fresh water tank was a five gallon water tank, just the good old regular five gallon blue jugs. Gray water tank was a seven gallon, and I'll put affiliate links for those if you're interested in getting those. Uh, I went with the seven gallon because it's 15% larger than the five, a little bit more than 15%. I switched water pumps this time around, went with a different water pump manufacturer just to test something different out. The spec on this I used 45 psi so it put out a little bit over three gallons per minute it, and it was absolutely plenty of pressure I used a sediment filter before and then an accumulator tank right afterwards to maintain pressure on the line and I'll, I'll put affiliate links for all those if you're interested in getting them I just got them from Amazon nothing special okay so for equipment on the coffee cart I went with a Danby mini commercial fridge I got it from Home Depot and I did not get this one by choice. I was kind of forced into it. Uh, the reason why I didn't foresee this one coming, but once you go below 34 inches, you are very limited on the types of mini commercial refrigerators that are out there. Above 34 inches in height, you have a lot more choice as a buyer. But when you're dealing with 34 inches or below, there's not much out there. So the Danby is what I ended up finding off of Home Depot. It did good. I mean, I you know, I, I would recommend it. It's a good refrigerator, but I would have liked to have more 
buyer's choice. I would have liked to have more buying power, but I, I wasn't able to do that simply because the height of my copy cart did not allow for it. The room from underneath the serving shelf to the bottom shelf on my coffee cart was less than 34 inches. So when you're building out your coffee cart, and I go over this in the ebook, one of the dimensions that I like for the height is at least to have above 34 inches in refrigerator height. Just gives you more buying power to go out and search for a refrigerator and get one that's at a decent price and enough cubic square footage. And I talk a little bit more about cubic square foot in the in the coffee cart ebook. I'll send you I'll send you there if you want more information on on the dimensions. All right, so for the espresso machine, I cheated. I bought a espresso machine off of Craigslist and refurbished it. So this was my first time refurbishing. I had never refurbished an espresso machine before, but I wanted to I wanted to learn how to do it. So I got this one off of Craigslist. The guy that I bought it from, he had been storing it for like three years. He used it in his small cafe, didn't know if it worked, was kind of his thing. So I offered him 300 bucks for the espresso machine and the grinder, and he took it. So I, I Brought those two home, and the first thing I did was I hired a, I booked a consultation with an, a technician and paid for them to come out and look at it. So he took a look at it, and he said, all right, this is what you need to do to refurbish it. He quoted me 500 bucks. Uh, I decided I was gonna save the 500 bucks and give it a crack myself. Um, so I did, took it all apart, pulled the boiler out, dipped the boiler in citric acid over a couple days, washed everything out, put it back in, redid all the gaskets, put a new vacuum breaker in it, some new screens, and then just generally cleaned it. Once I was done with it, I sanded it down and put a new coat of paint on it. So I painted it mint green, which came out really nice because it was kind of this ugly burgundy before and I wanted it like a you know like a bright color the mint green I've been getting real into I've been slowly trying to rebrand green joe from a lime green into a mint green so I've been uh, wanting to get more into that color with the grinder that one I took out the burrs put new burrs in it and then cleaned it out because it was a mess that thing was so dang mucky uh, I, it's never been cleaned before in its life I, there were times where I was cleaning it where I thought there was a it was a part, but it wasn't. It was just an accumulation of oil from, you know, the coffee grinds and oils being in there. It was just nasty. So I cleaned that one out, new set of grinders, put it all back together, sanded it down, painted it. That one cost me maybe 65 bucks to refurbish. And total time, I probably put maybe five or six hours into the, the grinder. And then for the espresso machine, I probably put another 100 bucks into it you know, the gaskets and the screens and stuff, vacuum breakers. That one took me more time because I had to pull out the boiler. And so I probably put, oh, I would say about eight hours into that one. So with those things, you know, I, I took the risk and it could have came out bad. I could have like purchased it, come to find out the boiler was bad and I would have had to purchase a new boiler and put it in. But the way I looked at this is the worst it could possibly be you know, maybe a new motherboard and a boiler, I'm still gonna come out ahead because new motherboards, 400 bucks, new boilers, maybe another 200 bucks. You know, I'm still gonna be less than a thousand bucks on this thing. Ultimately, I was like, yeah, okay, I'm willing to take the, the roll on the dice for that one. And it turned out to be good. That espresso machine was was pretty bomb. It was a nice, it was 220, a Faima Duo that was 221 group. So it had some steam power. I think it cooked some drinks quickly. So I liked it. It was a cool little machine. For the coffee pots, I just did pour over coffee and mixed it with my cold brew that I would heat up. I would just heat up the cold brew on the steamer on the espresso machine, uh, add some pour over coffee to it. That's my favorite drink. So it's something I was comfortable doing. And uh, I had three pour over cones. So I'd be able to make uh, three drinks at once. So my output was definitely limited by my own barista skills and my own barista speed. But I enjoyed it, you know, when I was doing the day in the life series, I would get up in the morning, go set up the truck. Usually the first half an hour, I would just be doing pour over coffees and putting them into an air pot. 
and I would just brew up a couple pots of coffee and just wait for business to come in. So I didn't mind it, but some of you folks may end up looking at getting a, a coffee pot or something. The blender, I used a Magic Bullet, which is not up to code and regulation, so that would have been a catch me if you can type of thing. It's not something I could recommend officially as a coffee consultant. However, I love those things. They're electric wattage. It's only 250 watts. They're a bit of a hand-free tool. Once you lock it into the housing unit, into the base unit, then it spins on its own. You don't have to like push a button or anything like that. So it frees your hands up to do other things. And it just allowed me to put fraps on the, the menu. All right, so bartender rinser, the one that I used was a really good one. Um, it had its own little sink, which was nice, its own little basin. Um, so I'll put an affiliate link if you're interested in that. So my pet peeve on coffee carts are pallet wood walls because they're just too heavy. And if you're, you know, single woman trying to operate this cart, it's gonna be like 300 pounds. Like there's no way you're gonna move that thing on your own. So ultimately I was trying to find materials that would be much more lightweight, but still had the aesthetic look and appeal of pallet wood. I ended up going with vinyl is what I ended up using, vinyl planks. Basically I glued the vinyl planks to hardboard, which is like an industrial cardboard. It's the same stuff that you use, that you make pegboards out of. So it's kind of like this pressed industrial cardboard stuff. Lightweight, sturdy, and that worked great. Uh, so I, I glued the vinyl planks to that and around the vinyl planks, I just used some vinyl trim to put a white framing around it and it gave it a real nice look. Now a side note to that is I took the cart in later on, uh, the cart in the trailer later on and got a pre-inspection from my health inspector. This is where she she hit me on the exposed wood. She did not like the uh, hardboard on the inside. So I had to go back and put FRP, which is kind of like the composites you use for shower walls. So I cut the FRP and glued that to the hardboard. And then she was fine with that. Something that I would speculate, I would be curious if one of you guys decide to go down this route is whether or not you can glue the vinyl planks just directly to the FRP and if that'll create a stable enough wall. I'd be interested in seeing if that worked. Uh, if not, another idea would be using vinyl floor sheeting and cutting that out and gluing that to FRP so that you had a non-corrosive washable surface on the inside of the cart but then on the outside of the cart the vinyl flooring comes in a bunch of different prints so maybe you, you could have like a you know a light gray one or they have some vinyl prints that look like uh, brick walls I thought that would be kind of cool anyhow so that's different ideas but and in the spirit of over complicating things because that's what I like to do I set out to build the walls so that they were detachable from the frame itself. What I wanted to do, my vision was to be able to have a bunch of different types of walls so that maybe on your website, you can have like a brick wall for business events, a maybe like a sanded down white washed wood walls that you see at weddings, a dark cherry one. Like I just had this idea of having like a bunch of different walls that you can just peel and stick as needed on the coffee cart and have a bunch of different aesthetic appeals. I thought that'd be kind of cool like to consult with a customer. Oh, okay, we're going to set, set up our coffee cart at your wedding. Is there, you know, one of these uh, designs that you like more than, than, than the others and having them kind of pick their own aesthetics to meet their events. So that was the vision, but it did not work out that way. <laughs> it turned out that uh, the magnets to attach the walls was just a dang mess. I mean, it, I ended up getting it to work, but the amount of time and resources that it went in to make that vision happen, I think over exceeded the the joy or glee it might bring a potential customer in the future. So if I were to do it again, I would just use self tappers, the self tapping screws and screw the dang thing onto the cart, screw the walls directly onto the cart. And if I wanted to change the walls for a different aesthetic wall or different look, then I would unscrew it and put the next one on. But I think trying to do the magnets, it just overcomplicated it and became too much of a headache. It worked, but it was it was a bit of a mess. 
Okay, so we got the walls put on, we got the plumbing put in, uh, we got the equipment tied down, and we got the exposed wood covered up, so everything looked good there. Here's the final results of the do-it-yourself coffee cart. Hey, it's Vince with Green Joe Coffee again. Um, so I want to do a quick overview of our coffee cart. This was the ultimate uh, espresso cart that I had built this spring. And this was a learning curve, you know. Um, it was a wonderful learning curve, though. We learned a lot building out this espresso cart. So we built this one out for less than five grand, okay? Um, this is a refurbished espresso machine, a Faima. It's a single group, but it is 220 volt. And this is the grinder that came with it, and that one we refurbished as well. Um, down here, you can see that it has a hot water tank. That's a 2.5 hot water tank. It also has a accumulator. Those are in the back, an accumulator and a pump. And then I do filter my water um, here. It's just a basic carbon filter. Um, and then a hand washing sink also. So you can wash your hands on this. You can clearly, you can make coffee. You have a two, uh, 220 espresso machine on there with a uh, grinder. And this is a commercial refrigerator, so it does meet code. These are just little plastic storage that we got at like the dollar store. It's cheap and it's functional. But the whole idea behind this cart is that uh, you wanna be able to move it in and out of the horse trailer so that you can do uh, catering. Uh, if I need to take this indoors and do catering, um, then I can uh, wheel it inside and do a wedding or a business venue or something. The other thing that we tried to do, and I don't know if I would do it in the future, but uh, we put these panels on here. We made these panels out of laminate um, wood floors instead of the pallet wood, and that's just so it's light. So I made these uh, magnetic just the magnets that attach it keep it tagged on to that so you know in the future I would just put the laminate floor directly onto the prep table so the whole idea behind this was that someone could start an espresso cart I really wanted to try to keep it underneath five grand I figure okay maybe like a single mom wants to earn some money on the weekend so if she saves up a couple grand and gets a big payday from her tax refund she'll be able to at least get started so we used to have, you know, these type of thing you could set up at a farmer's market. I used to do a farmer's market here in Albuquerque. On average, it made 500 bucks on a Saturday morning. So it adds, what, $2,000 to your, to your pocket. So you recoup it in, in, in a few months. It's, it's a worthy investment. But then eventually that person's going to be able to need to step from their cart into a trailer. And that's essentially what this is. And to just recap some of the take-home points, uh, one, use a pre-built uh, tabletop if you can it's going to save you a lot of headache I prefer the workbenches uh, n number two no exposed wood ever you can put resins on wood and um, and seal them that way but you're not allowed to have any type of exposed wood uh, number three find your fridge first make your measurements to your height and find your fridge number four consider adding all your plumbing your hand washing sinks your triple sinks to another rolling cart that you bring in on a separate trip. You roll your equipment cart in that has all your espresso, your coffee stuff on it, and then separately rolling in your plumbing cart and just having them on two different carts. Okay, so once the cart was done, I then began to focus my attention on the trailer. Uh, so this is the trailer. Now with the trailer, the protocol was to create like a roll in, roll out scenario. So I needed to be able to open up the back doors. Um, it would have been nice to have one that had a, a ramp built in already, uh, but I, I wasn't able to find that. I did find this trailer on Craigslist. I like this one because it had uh, brand new tires on it. There was very limited rust that that the trailer had. It was white already, which meant it was gonna be easier to paint. I didn't have to put a primer set on it. I would be able to just paint it uh, right out the gate. The negative to it, it was a horse trailer. So the thing smelled like horse piss, uh, which meant there was gonna be a lot of renovation that had to go in to get this thing ready for the, you know, for the health department, for the use of food and beverage hired a guy from Craigslist and he helped me just the first thing was just rip the floors out so we pulled all the subflooring pulled out the uh, 2x12s that were that the floors were made out of all of that gone 
and I replaced it with new 2x12s and used OBS as my subflooring and then a layer of vinyl, of sheet vinyl flooring over that. Uh, then we sanded down the entire thing with angle grinders. I got a chance to use some Bondo to patch up some of the different areas on the trailer. It was, I had never messed with Bondo before. I wanted to gain the experience of how to work with this material. Um, so it was fun. I, I liked it. I was able to fill in some of the dents and the scratches and stuff using it and it smoothed out pretty well. So it was a new skill set I got off the project so I was excited about that. Uh, we sanded down all the rusty spots on the thing and went around siliconing all the cracks. Finding all the cracks that we could and silicone them. Then I bought a paint sprayer from Harbor Freight. It was not their bottom of the barrel but the next step up and from there we used exterior white paint and painted the trailer and we sprayed it uh, from the inside and out we just sprayed the whole thing down for the exterior i wanted to give it a little bit more of a cute look so because it wasn't on the coffee cart this was where i was able to do pallet wood so i found some free pallet wood on craigslist went down there picked a whole bunch up um, spent a day cutting it up with a reciprocating saw and then I used the paint sprayer to paint all the pallet wood down. I went back with and just did some light sanding to it and that gave it a real nice rustic look. I used four different colors. I used a dark teal, uh, the mint green that I painted the espresso machine, uh, a white, and then a dark wood looking, uh, the, the name of the resin uh, epoxy was espresso. It's kind of an espresso dark colored wood look this kind of rustic look you'll see i ended up making the windows out of that same uh, resin and i just attached it all to the truck using self tappers okay so there were five windows in total there was the large serving window which i put on the passenger side the small window on the driver's side there was a front window on the bow of the trailer and then in the back of the trailer there were two large windows where the horse's ass sticks out so for the large serving window, I first started with two sections, but I just found out that that was a mess. Basically what happened was it, they were too heavy. I didn't like the way they looked. So ultimately I ended up scrapping that idea and just going with one large window that made up that whole passenger side. I did split it up into three different panels. So the window was had three different pieces of glass. I did not use glass. I ended up using polycarbonate, which I got off of Home Depot because it's shatterproof. It's not like pexi glass that shatters when it breaks or you know any other type of glass. I would have had to go with the tempered glass if I wanted to actually go with glass glass. And it was just so expensive and so difficult to cut that it just made more sense to go with the polycarbonate. Um, I ended up using kickstands to hold the window up. I did try to use gas struts initially but the gas struts that I picked up were for toy boxes, like a toy chest. And the connection points on those, I didn't even snap until I tried to actually put the thing on. The connection points, one of them sits, you know, kind of vertical and the other one sits kind of horizontal. So that it attaches to the wall of the toy box and the roof of the toy box and that's how the strut works so the problem with that was when i tried to attach them to my window the window i really needed um, the two attachment points to both be um, uh, horizontal it just didn't sit right and i for the life of me i tried every way i could to make those things work and i, I couldn't make them work so ultimately i just had to end up sticking with a kickstand and the kickstand was set up on two magnets. So once you stuck it in there, the wind wasn't going to knock it out. You know, it was stable, but still I would have liked to have the, the gas struts. You know, looking back, the next couple trucks that I built after that, I just purchased my concession windows. And to me, that's the way to go. I won't build a window ever again because it was, that window took a long time. There was a lot of cuts. It was very finicky, you know, and it just ultimately, it was out of my skill set. So I think in the future, I'll just purchase a concession window and then install it in. We did that on the mobile coffee roaster that we built after this. And the window on my horse trailer probably took two weeks to build. I mean, it really took a long time. The window on the mobile coffee roaster, I had it done in a day. Now, I don't even think it took a day. I mean, a lot of it was just 
the measurements for cutting but once I got it in there it was, it was done so okay so for the walls I insulated the walls uh, because the insulation was just wonderful uh, I really underestimated the power of insulation previously working with the insulation on uh, the horse trailer but now I've, I've, I've just come to learn that insulation will get you a long way so I used a uh, half inch foam insulation on the horse trailer because I just didn't have a lot of room you know, I would have liked to have thicker insulation I mean an inch up to two inches maybe on the roof would have been really nice but just didn't have the room for it and then I put OSB on top of the foam and then attached FRP board to the OSB and I tried this in a couple different ways I tried it in layers where I would put the insulation in first then I would back it up with the OSB and then finally I would put some glue on and stick the FRP board to the OSB and use some braces to kind of push the FRP into the OSB so that it could seal and then I the other way I tried it was gluing the insulation to the OSB and then also gluing the FRP to the OSB all before I attached anything to the wall. So kind of making this unit, so to speak, of insulation, OSB, and, and FRP board, and then attaching that whole unit to the wall. So one of them I did by layers and the other I did the layers um, before I tried to put it on the wall. I thought the one where I created the unit and then attach it to the wall would be easier, but it wasn't. It turned out like doing it one layer at a time was, was easier. And again, that goes back to the cut to measure philosophy. Ultimately, it was easier to get the, the layers than it was to, to try to put in a whole unit at once. So yeah. Okay, so the roof, I insulated the roof. I used half inch foam on that one as well. And this is where I learned that rubber nails eats styrofoam. I did not know that. Uh, so I ended up tacking the insulation to the roof using hot glue just little beads of hot glue and that would tack it up to the roof and then after i got a few of them on i was able to just kind of cut the insulation to where it was a tight fit and it kind of held itself up there and that gave me at least enough time to go up there and get some bead board which is what i used uh for the finish of the roof and the the bead board was it was okay I will probably work with that material again. I liked it because it was lightweight and washable, but I think there are some other uh, materials that would work for the roof. Uh, tongue and groove would work for the roof. Shiplap would work for the roof. So looking back, I would probably just, I liked the tongue, I liked the look of tongue and groove. So I would most likely go with like a pine tongue and groove um, as opposed to using the bead board again. Uh, I did want to make a quick note here. Horse trailers are absolutely notorious for leaking. I mean, they're just not set up to be waterproof, weatherproof vehicles. Before you put any walls or roof in or any of that jazz, you really want to go around and seal the outside and the inside side with silicone and then hit it with a hose spray that dang thing down and see if it's it's leaking at all because once you get your roof and your walls up going back and trying to find leaks is going to be next to impossible so just take them take a day out make sure everything is absolutely siliconed and then hit it with a spray hose make sure that you're good to go then look on putting your insulation, your walls in. On that side note, while we're talking about orders of operation, you'll notice I put my floor in first and then my walls in next. For you guys out in California, you may want to consider putting in your walls first and your floors last because you need to have that four inch extension that comes up your wall. So it's nice to be able to put in that vinyl floor in the end because then you can just have the vinyl floor come up the the wall and, and that way you clear the code the health code on having that four inch extension also i did my walls first and put in my electric after that um, some of you may want to consider putting your electric into the walls i ran my conduit uh, on the outside of the walls and ran it a little bit high above the equipment line uh, but some of you folks may want to consider running your electric through the walls where the insulation is there's different types of conduit that you have to get for inside the wall versus outside the wall so make sure you check with your electrician on what type of conduit goes wear. Okay, for the plumbing, I just hired a plumber. Um, I did buy all the equipment ahead of time. I laid it all out. I put it in order. The fresh water tank goes to the pump. From the pump, it goes to this, this, and this. So I laid it all out for him to see in the beginning. And I put all that equipment, again, I'm going to product drop here, but I put that list in the know the cost course. So all that is there if you're interested in calculating the cost of your plumbing. 
but I laid everything out for the plumber to come. He came in that morning. I remember he looked at it and I went through and explained, okay, this is the direction of travel of the water as it goes from the fresh to the sinks. This is the direction of travel as it goes from the sinks to the gray tank. And I just had all the equipment laid out as such. He just grabbed them, started fiddling around with it, and he was able to put everything in within a day. I did cut my own holes for my sinks and had my sinks laid out. I didn't glue them in until he was done though. All right, so here's the plumbing diagram. So here's the fresh water. And as the fresh water comes out, now the first thing you need to do on your fresh water, this is my opinion on how to set up plumbing, is to have a quick, uh, or is to have a T shut off. And the reason why is because inevitably something's gonna go bad with your trailer at some point, you need to shut your water off from the rest of the trailer. Just like your house has a shut off valve at the sidewalk, your trailer needs to have a shut off valve immediately after the tank. So then from there, you go to your pump, I like to have a sediment filter before my pump. So then I hit my pump right after my pump, I have an accumulator. And then I think it's also another good idea to have another shutoff valve right there, just in case you need to switch your pump out. The system of the truck is very reliant upon the pump and your workflow is very reliant upon your pump. If you're gonna, if you plan on doing big festivals, then consider being able to switch your pump out in the event you run into pump failure, because otherwise it just leaves you like a sitting duck. You can't get any water to your espresso machine, which means you can't make drinks. So this is the one of the areas of this system that I think is the weakest, and you should plan on being able to back up that system in the event you reach failure. Then from there, you split, and your split should go to your sink. So you can see here I have a split that goes to my sinks. One of them's gonna go to your triple, one of them's gonna go to your hand wash. Right before you get to your hand wash, there should be another split. You can filter your hand washing, or you can put in another faucet. I put in another faucet so that um, I'm only pulling filtered water from this faucet. It reduces the amount of filters that you go through. You don't have to do it that way. It's a little bit, you know, again, overcomplicating things, but I like to do it that way because then I just go through less filters. But you could theoretically just filter any of your water to your hand washing sink. And then if you need water to make coffee with, you can pull it from your hand washing sink and you know it's gonna be filtered water. You'll be cleaning your hands with filtered water. You're just filtering the water to only that one faucet and not to your triple sink. Originally, I put in my, my very first truck, the original green gel, I put my filter in right after my pump, which meant every time I was washing dishes, I was washing my dishes with filtered water. That's just literally money going down the drain, right? So I try to be a little bit exclusive about which water I'm filtering and for me it's, I have it on this spigot and then as well as on the espresso machine. But anyhow, going back to the branches from your cold water, once you come off your pump, you're gonna to branch to your triple sink and your hand washing sink, and then you need one more branch to go to your, your hot water. And then your hot water only has to branch to your hand washing sink and your triple sink, unless you also want it to go to your a coffee rinser, which is perfectly fine. You could do that as well. This was the, the system that I had set up, but it's not one that I would necessarily recommend because again, it just, it really did overcomplicate the plumbing. It worked, but it wasn't, I don't know. I, I think there's better ways to do it. You know, you learn as you go. All right, and then, you know, number 10 down here. So this is a RV drain hose. So I made that for the RV so that the gray water can drain to the RV. Number 12 right here is a backflow prevention device. Device. It just stops any type of uh, gray water coming back up your lines and going into your sinks. So it's basically a one-way valve is what that one is. And then number 11 down here is a vent. So it went to the outside of the truck. Some people like to do studer vents. That's fine too. It just depends on your code and regulations on whether or not they'll allow that. But your tanks need to have some type of vents in there. And then your vents need to be screened so that bugs can't get into your vents. Um, you need a vent both on your fresh as well as your gray. You need it on your fresh, not necessarily to vent out odor because it's fresh water, but so that you allow air to get out because otherwise it'll bulge and it'll kind of mess up your tank over time. And then your vent for your gray water, you need that to allow the nasty smell out. So you want that vent to go outside your truck. I think both vents should go outside your truck, you know, just in case you overfill your fresh for whatever reason. You're not spilling water all over your truck. All right, so that's the plumbing diagram. Okay, and I will put 
uh, links for the pumps and filters and rinsers and everything in the description. For the electric, so I learned a lot about electric on this project, which was good. Um, it really increased my electric skill set. So here you have the panel. This is a 100 amp panel. As you can see here, I have a, a 30 amp breaker and then a bunch of 15 amp breakers after that. Um, so it's 100 amps total. Now, we're missing some spacers here. Uh, there needs to be something filling in these cracks, and we'll talk about that in just a bit. Uh, but yeah, so basically it's a 100 amp panel, and it's getting fed down here through my inlet. And I'll show you where that, oh, excuse me, this is my inlet. I'll show you where that goes. And this is my 220 circuit. And then over here I have one circuit that runs this way towards the other wall, and then I have these three circuits. So up top, you can see three circuits popping out. They drop down, and then immediately they start to split. One goes down there, and then these two break up and go here. What these are, these are weatherproof boxes, essentially. They're called in-use boxes. Okay, so I have in-use boxes on all these covers. You're going to see that there. And then, so from there, the one that splits, you can see there's one 15 amp circuit down here and that splits. So that comes over here and actually pops up here. So here you're going to see I have a uh, 15 amp in use cover. Let's see if I can move this out of the way. All right, so there's, and you're going to see there's GFI right there. It's GFI and then it actually splits. I have one that goes up here and that's to my light. See the light? And then it drops down here, comes across my window, and feeds into this one, which is a USB. Now, okay, so let's cover my 220 line. So I have a 220 line that just drops straight down that panel and comes immediately over here. And when you open this thing up, you can see right there is where I have my 220 circuit. Now that only has 30 amps, but you know I think that's gonna be able to fit the majority of espresso machines. And then on each one of these is a GFI circuit. So there's GFI, these are all GFCI. Okay, so here we are outside the coffee truck taking a look at uh, the inlet. And this one right here, as you can see, it's a generator four prong locking. And what this does is this feeds the main line that comes in here and feeds the uh, circuit breaker panel. Now, in my next coffee truck that I built, the coffee roaster, the electrician there told me that the panel could not be by the sinks. But in this one, the electrician did not tell me that the panel can't be by the sinks. You know, after this project, you know, I, I worked with a different electrician. and He was like, yeah, you can't have your panels near your sinks because of water splashing. And so we put the panel on the outside but on this one the panel was on the inside which doesn't make a lot of sense to me because my electric panel for my house is outside and it's exposed to like rain you know so I don't know how that goes if it has something to do with grounding maybe he knows something that I don't but he was very adamant about that making sure that the panel was away from the sinks so in the future that's at this point that's all I put my panels is away from sinks okay moving on to decor so for the menu um, I just set up this basically like a clip that uh, was next to a wood rack but the idea with that is that I would make my menus on yard sale signs they're weatherproof you can put pictures you can print them you can have multiple different signs so you can have multiple prices one for festivals one for regular business I took a wood crate and cut it in half and used that same resin that I used on the windows and I put half of the wood crate on the outside where I put coffee so that I can sell product. I set that up to be able to house two pound bags so if someone wanted to buy coffee from me um, you can either have a one pound bag sitting in that crate or a two pound bag and then the other half of the crate went inside and served as my uh, syrup holder for all my beverage syrups. The window, the shelf underneath my serving window, I made that one out of vinyl planks, fake planks for wood decking, you know, the fake wood decks. They make those out of vinyl, so I used vinyl for that one. That stuff was great. I really like that material. I'll work with that again. It's a little bit expensive, so I wouldn't do it for necessarily everything, 
but it's sturdy, it's weatherproof, it's washable, it's not exposed wood. It was a great material to work with. Easy to cut, easy to drill into, I liked it a lot. For the coffee sign, I used battery powered marquee signs that I got off of Amazon. I'll throw the affiliate link in. Uh, those ones I had to put my own magnets on. I wanted it to be, uh, you could permanently attach it, but the way I set that coffee sign up is you can pull those magnets off and then put them on the coffee cart. So it had a dual purpose. And I went with battery power because I wanted to be able to turn on the lights as I was driving down the road and that allowed me to do it. But you could set it up off a of 12 volt or 110. I just went with battery power. Also, I put the coffee sign above eye level because in festivals or very crowded environments, you want to be able to see what a food truck is and it's hard to do when there's a bunch of people standing in front of it so i wanted my coffee sign to be above head level basically okay and so this is how the truck looks once we had it all fixed up and ready to go so i took the truck once i was done with it i took it to get permitted and on the first time i took it in to get permitted i did fail my inspection so let me tell you why <laughs> one is there was some cracks in the back windows now i originally to make those windows I used some of the steel from the inside of the coffee trailer and I framed it out using wood but it didn't sit a hundred percent so there was there was a little bit of crack between the window and the uh, roof itself which eventually I just use window sealer to fill in it's like this foam that you use to put around like window units for air conditioners because that's what I use to seal that area up I missed because of that and then the day of the inspection, there was this piece that I guess the plumber didn't glue. I didn't know, I had no idea. And when I got to the uh, the unit and turned everything on, I had a leak. So I had to go back and fix that. Um, the plumber didn't plumb that piece in right there, or excuse me, didn't um, glue that piece right there. You can see that there's some glue right here, but not, not on this one. And that had popped off in transit on my gray tank and so I didn't know and I was making sink I was I was cleaning up in here making making my sinks and everything and uh, so that popped off and it was basically just draining and so it looked like I had a water leak but but uh, it was just that gray drain that popped off so I have some glue at home I'll glue that on unfortunately it's just something I didn't foresee and you know looking back on it and it wasn't it wasn't a leak that you could tell by turning everything on it was like you had to bump down the road a little bit yeah I, I, I missed that one so she kicked it back she said okay well you know go seal up this crack make sure this plumbing squared away and then we'll talk again so literally the next week um, I made another appointment went back in and got my green sticker and passed my health inspection okay so once I had this thing up and running I wanted to take it out for a spin so I was like, okay, how do you find a location? You know, so I started digging into a couple locations and I'll show you this one. This is the one that I like. So this is Washington and Zuni. And this is a, an area in our town where there's a lot of daily vehicle traffic, uh, specifically a lot of morning traffic. On this side of the road uh, where the morning traffic comes in, there was a mechanic shop. The guy recently retired, COVID hit, and he was up for retirement anyway. So he's like, man, I might as well just close the doors. So he closed the doors on the business and that was the guy who I approached to set up. Now when I first approached him, when I found out he was retired, the first thing I thought is, okay, well, telling this guy I'm going to pay him money isn't going to do much because he's retired. Money's no longer his concern, obviously. So the angle that I kind of took on this one was, was the entrepreneurship angle. I said, look, this is what I do. I help people start food trucks. I start coffee trucks, get into entrepreneurship. I help people start up from the ground up. This is part of my video series on how to start coffee trucks. Would you be willing to let me set up in your, your lot for a month? And he told me no twice before he said yes. So <laughs> persistence uh, is key. So he told me no twice. I sent him pictures. Now, when I first emailed him, I emailed him with my insurance. I sent him the insurance right out the gate, pictures of the truck, and you know, hey, this is what it looks like, this is what I do. He replied, no, I said, you know, not a problem. I understand if you change your mind, take a look at this video. It's a little bit about me and what I, and what I like to do. And then we went back and forth for a little while. He ended up agreeing to it. So I set up in that location. It was a great location. 
I, d I did that for about a month. In the beginning, I only saw a few cups per day and slowly as I started building, within my first week, I was seeing about 50 bucks a day. The second week, I was pulling in about 100 bucks a day and then something happened. Oh, there was another restriction on COVID for my third week and they shut down businesses for the third week uh, in the state of New Mexico. So I didn't get the third week and the fourth week was about the same as the second week. If I stuck around long enough, I would have probably started getting closer to 200 $300 days. Uh, I set it up as a drive through and so it just took a little time to get people used to moving through the drive through I just used cones is basically how I set it up. And it worked good. You know, I would take people's orders. I would, uh, from the window, they would stay in their car. Then I would get out and uh, hand them their drink and take their cash and their credit card and send them on their way. So it turned out to be a good location. And I think it was definitely a promising location. Uh, my hours were 7 to 11 and I set up a bunch of signs as you're coming down the road showing that there was a coffee truck coming up and the first cup was one dollar that was how i got people into the truck first cup is a dollar because i know if you're willing to pay a buck for your first cup and you liked it most likely you would pay full price the second time around so that was and giving away free coffee i've tried that before never really gotten great success off of it there's something about free that people kind of stay away from so you know the dollar for the first cup seemed to work a little bit better than just trying to offer free coffee. And it was nice because at least it covered my cost of goods, so I wasn't losing money on the promotion. All right, so I ended up selling the coffee truck to a gal in California. The entire time, the, the horse trailer was never meant for me to operate. It was always an experiment to, to create a stepping stone, a platform, an educational experience for people getting into the business. So I sold it to a gal uh, in California. She was splitting up with her business partner to go out on her own and she lived in a county where they did a bunch of horse stuff so the horse trailer was perfect for her when I sold it to her I gave her all my courses and business plan and ebooks and everything you know everything that I had as far as written material I said here goes built out some floor plans for her so that she can send it off to the um, state they were rejected on a few things she needed an exit window she needed the four inch extension they didn't like the size of my sinks there was a few other things that the health inspector in California didn't like about the trailer. I don't remember off the top of my head. She had to make some adjustments to her, her floor plans to get them uh, passed on in her county. All right, and that is all I have for you guys on the coffee cart and horse trailer experiment project that I had. It was a fun project, you know. There's some things that I'm definitely, I look back on and I just go, oh gosh, Vince, why did you do it that way? But that's part of the experience is just learning as you go. One of some, a couple of the great lessons that I learned from this project is cut to measure, meaning don't buy it before you're ready to use it. So I hold off on buying things now and just kind of sit with them and really try to get an understanding on them before I pull the trigger on them. So that was a great lesson that I pulled from that one. It taught me a lot about the electric, it taught me a lot about the plumbing. This horse trailer was the main catalyst to my coffee truck crash courses. I said, okay, well, if I can't figure out a code and regulation for coffee carts, let's divert our attention to a code and regulation for coffee trucks. And so I started working on a minimal viable product or a lowest common denominator, a set of code and regulations that's going to meet the vast majority of code and regulations out there. So I created the code and regulations ebook from that. So this experiment really kind of sent me forward in my education on learning everybody's code and regulations. And that was good. That was, it was a, a, a real good push for me and it helped me create the, the crash course. So I'm grateful for that. It taught me a lot about building coffee carts. And from the coffee cart from here, I turned around and put out the coffee cart ebook because I learned so much about the electricity and the plumbing and the framing and the materials. I was able to take all that and put it into the coffee cart ebook. The coffee cart ebook you know, rather than just creating one floor plan for everyone, because I've seen a lot of coffee cart ebooks, and basically what they'll do is they'll be like, well, this is my coffee, you know, this is the coffee cart we, we build, and here's the dimensions to it and how to do the plumbing. And I thought, okay, I can do that. I, again, I learned that not one size fits all on carts. So with this one, I really set out to try to say, okay, here you can do it like this. I did 
definitely give a floor plan for my coffee cart and this is how I like to do it. But I also really just try to open up people's horizon. And there's a lot of aha moments that I got from building out this coffee cart and was able to put that into the coffee cart ebook. So I, I feel like it helped me definitely create a better product for, for folks wanting to get into coffee carting. Okay, my goodness, I think that is enough on this one. <laughs> Thank you so much for hanging in and, and tuning into this as far as you have. My name is Vince. I'm with Green Joe Coffee. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you on the next one. Hey, it's Vince with Green Joe Coffee again. Um, so I want to do a quick overview of our coffee cart. This was the ultimate uh, espresso cart that I had built uh, this spring. And this was a learning curve, you know. Um, it was a wonderful learning curve, though. We learned a lot building out this espresso cart. So we built this one out for less than five grand, okay? Um, this is a refurbished espresso machine, a Faima. It's a single group, but it is 220 volt. And this is the grinder that came with it, and that one we refurbished as well. Um, down here, you can see that it has a hot water tank. That's a 2.5 hot water tank. It also has a accumulator. Those are in the back, an accumulator and a pump. And then I do filter my water. Um, here, it's just a basic carbon filter. Um, and then the hand washing sink also. So you can wash your hands on this. You can clearly, you can make coffee. You have a two, uh, 220 espresso machine on there with a uh, grinder. And this is a commercial refrigerator, so it does meet code. These are just little plastic um, storage that we got at like the dollar store. It's cheap and it's functional. But the whole idea behind this cart is that uh, you wanna be able to move it in and out of the horse trailer so that you can do uh, catering. Uh, if I need to take this indoors and do catering, um, then I can uh, wheel it inside and do a wedding or a business venue or something. The other thing that we tried to do, and I don't know if I would do it in the future, but uh, we put these panels on here. We made these panels out of laminate um, wood floors instead of the pallet wood. And that's just so it's lighter. I wanted to keep this whole thing under 3,500 pounds so Subaru Outback would be able to tow it. Now, just doing different business events and weddings, what I've come to learn is people like different styles. And so I made these uh, magnetic. It's just the magnets that attach it, keep it tagged on to that. I think in the future, I would probably just go with one, uh, one style, even though this gives me the benefit of doing different versions or different looks. Um, I think I would give up that for just a little bit more stability. You know, these things were kind of a pain in the butt to put on. Um, and to be honest, that would have just been one day's work, but I think this one took me probably a week to figure out how to do all this. So, you know, in the future, I would just put the laminate floor directly onto the prep table. And I got this one from Amazon. You can find that stuff on my resource page. All this stuff's on my resource page. Um, so the whole idea behind this was that someone could start an espresso cart. I really wanted to try to keep it underneath five grand. I figure, okay, maybe like a single mom wants to earn some money on the weekend. So if she saves up a couple grand and gets a big payday from her tax refund, she'll be able to at least get started. So we used to have, you know, these type of thing you could set up at a farmer's market. I used to do a farmer's market here in Albuquerque. On average, I made 500 bucks on a Saturday morning. So it adds, what, $2,000 to your, to your pocket. Um, so you recoup it in, in, in a few months. It's, it's a worthy investment. But then eventually that person's gonna be able to need to step from their cart into a trailer, and that's essentially what this is. So we set up the trailer. Come on in, man, follow me in here. So the, the, it's a, you know, it's a horse trailer. So we had to literally gut the whole thing out, redo the floors. This is sheet vinyl floors. This is FRP board. And so it has to be a washable light surface. And just from my experience in the past, I really like insulated roofs. So I insulated the roof and that was a, that was a piece of work. Let me tell you, trying to get that insulation right on that curved roof. I think in the future, I would probably just stick to a, um, you know, I don't know. I, I think I like the camper idea a little bit more these days, but this was a neat project to work on. Um, this is just food storage up here. Um, we have some stuff in the back. This is where uh, my syrup rack and uh, my panels are going to be on, on this side. Let me show you where that's at. Uh, 
All right, so these are my water tanks here. It's my gray waste, and this is my fresh 20 gallons, 30 gallons. Oh, me, let's go around here, man. So we bust ourselves over that ramp. All right, here's the other side. Here's the other side of the trailer. This is where I have my electric inlet, um, where I plug in on my generator. That feeds my panel. Um, I use a 100 amp panel, it's what I prefer. This is my water inlet, and then here I have a vent. Um, I did have to grind the whole trailer down and paint it, um, and then we also had to put in a new stem. Uh, but it came with great frame and great tires, so it was a, a steal. This paneling that I put, come back around here. So this paneling is just a wood pallet. Uh, this paneling is just wood pallet. Uh, basically, I just cut the wood pallets down, sprayed it down with a layer of paint, and sanded it to give it this vintage vibe. This is plastic decking. Um, your contact surfaces need to be washable. Um, so this is a uh, basically just a deck plank. Um, and then these the signs up here for coffee. Those are magnetic. Um, the reason why is you can turn them on and drive. I really like that idea. But also you can take those down and put it on the cart if you want to. So that was the whole concept there. <laughs> it's nice because you can just stop and edit and just let it flow out. Yeah. You ready? Yep. Go for it. Um, yeah, so the plastic so we use plastic decking for this shelf because uh, uh, it's got a nice look to it and you gotta be able to make sure it's washable. This coffee rack, it fits two pound bags. So if you're gonna sling beans out of your window, um, I like selling two pounds at a time. You just move more product basically. Um, so uh, you could stack two pound bags inside that one. And then this menu right here, um, this is the size, sorry man. <laughs> this is the, uh, the size of a yard sale sign. So you can just print your men menu on a yard sale um, from like Vista Print, real cheap. Um, so yeah, we got the light up there. Let's see. Is there anything else I wanted to cover? <laughs> the window? No, I don't want that. Button. <laughs> okay, so, uh, here we have a quick little tour of the coffee truck. It's with the window open. There's a little some marquee signs. And these are just on here actually with magnets. Um, they'll pop right off and then you put them wherever the hell you want um, on the truck. But those are all battery operated. And then here's the window. And that's just being propped with a little kickstand here. There's a little light and this is a menu and I set this menu up so that you can uh, get yard sale signs printed from either your local FedEx or Vistaprint or whatever, and that'll be your menu essentially. And then here, I still have to create some shelving for a coffee bag, um, selling coffee bags. Basically, it'll look like a spice rack, but uh, I'll fit some 12 ounce or 16 ounce coffee bags on there for sale some retail stuff. And then this thing, this is uh, plastic decking and that's what I used for the, and man, it is on there. That thing is solid. Um, just bolted that in right here with these big old two inches. But yeah, that looks great. That came out really good. And coming around here, this is my vent and my, you know, my backflow. And then in here, here's my sinks to show a little bit more and this is a little experiment that I'm working on with uh, uh, sound buffering inside here is um, some foam insulation so I'm using that to essentially uh, soundproof water intake three-quarter inch this is 7500 watt inlet for my generator and over here these are the back doors 
So that's how that looks. Just pop these open. So they'll stay closed with this thing. Just a little bolt there. Okay, USB charger. So this will be my point of sale system. Probably be either over here or over here. And then espresso machine. I'm gonna actually have it live right there. Hand washing station. Come on over here. Bartender rinser. That's just getting glued down right now. So triple sinks. I put the little um, quick connect faucet here so that uh, if I need to wash out Cambros, I can wash out Cambros. Again, these are the cutouts that I end up using for the back doors. Panel. And this is the vinyl. This is the same vinyl that I used on my floor. So same vinyl on my floor. I just cut that into some strips there and then bolted it on with uh, roofing screws because they use this little rubber gasket underneath and those rubber gas let me see if I can zoom into that rubber gasket that waterproofs those screws so I like that and then I silicone the edge and all that all that siliconed I still got some more work to do. I gotta stick some silicone beads and stuff, but you know, it's coming along. I'm gonna do a little quick tour of the coffee truck forward slash espresso cart. It's kind of a hybrid. You can roll the cart in and out of the trailer. It's a horse trailer conversion. So we'll just kind of start off on this side. So this, uh, this panel has little USB outlets that you can plug in, and this is a you know, magnet for the kickstand, of course, little lock. There's the window, kind of shoot over here. I put in three different panels, so if one of them breaks, you don't have to replace the whole thing. So, um, And then ice bin with a little scoop in there. Um, this is my light for outside for the menu. Um, some masks, some gloves, because it's COVID. Uh, this is a little drain, um, so it's uh, um, it's got a little little hole in it, so it drains in here. So th those ones are glued down. And in the back there, you can see I have uh, some uh, pour over cones and some cheapy coffee. I was doing some training, some gloves back there. It's a triple sink, um, and this faucet is uh, this little accordion faucet. I really like it, but it disattaches here from a quick disconnect, so you can attach like a hose and a uh, sprayer if you want, clean out like your Cambros and hot chocolate dispensers and whatnot. Back there's my sanitization bucket, um, steam pitcher, uh, another drain. In here is my uh, rinser for my um, steam pitchers. Uh, these are what I use to make my cold brew. There's my panel, 100 amp panel, 40 amps on the 220, and then four 15 amps um, after. Um, here is, this is just a little, uh, thing that I put on to hold my syrups, all my syrups in there and a little paper towel rack that I just bungeed on. So it's cheap, but it works. It's so my 220 line. Um, this is just a little, um, steam pitcher I use to hold all my tools. Um, knock box, 110 line. Um, this is my tamper. It's one of those spring activated tampers. When you get enough pressure, it goes to spring down. My jigger that I use for my syrups because I think it's more accurate than a pump. Um, this is my um, Faima grinder. Uh, I refurbished this one. I put new burrs in there, clean the whole thing out, um, so it's nice and tight. And that's just held on with a couple a couple bungees and magnets, but it works great. So I like this one because if you ever lose your tamper, you got another backup. So I like that. And then this is the espresso machine. It's a Faima uh, single group 220. The reason I like that is because um, the 220 boiler or the 220 heating element and a smaller boiler means it has a greater steam output and so it just makes drinks faster. So essentially it's just a little workhorse which is really nice. Um, some teas that I have up there, this is my straws, my stir sticks and my, uh, my uh, um, sleeves. So uh, down here is my... Filtered water, I only filter my water to the espresso machine and this spigot, all the other water is unfiltered. 
that's another circuit 15 amps my hand washing station um, 9 by 5 by 9 so it meets code it's kind of interesting mix up that I have down here so this is just hot water heater um, a little radiant heater and what it does is it just keeps my um, my pumps hot from freezing and then you can see it's kind of lined in this two inch foam and I have one other panel that kind of comes out and I just put that there at night and it creates this little chamber um, to ensure that the the heat from this radiant heater comes up and keeps my espresso machine from freezing over. Um, this is a little three cubic foot uh, commercial refrigerator. Um, it holds four gallons of milk, three half gallons of almond or whatever you want, and then two of those half and halves. Um, there's a little trash can back here. This is a little wood panel, and basically it's on magnets. There's some magnets up there attaching it to this wall. And basically what happens is this comes off and will stick on the side of the espresso cart. This whole cart rolls out of the uh, horse trailer. I have ramps for that. So you can do like indoor catering if you wanted to. And then because that wall is magnetic, it pops off and attaches here to the, the cart. And then the front, there's another one. There's another one for the sides. So the entire thing looks um, real cute. It has kind of this wood floor vibe to it. So that's it. That's uh, the little uh, espresso cart uh, for, the, for the most part. I mean, some drawers and a mirror. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, this is Vince with Green Joe Coffee Truck, and welcome, welcome to my mobile coffee roaster.